Good morning and welcome to this conference. Uh, to begin with, for the inaugural session, I request uh, uh, my director, Professor Devan Thakkar, to kindly escort Professor Mantha to the dais. Welcome, sir. As you would have noticed from the conference schedule, there are so many speakers uh, whose biodata reads into several pages. So when I introduce them, please forgive me if I use only 30 seconds to mention a few quick snippets. We'll, of course, put all the bios on the thing. So without further ado, I invite Professor Devan Khakkar to deliver his brief welcome address to all of you. Thank you, Professor Fatak. Uh, Professor Mantha, uh, distinguished delegates, colleagues, students, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to IIT Bombay uh, and to this conference on this very important topic of technology in higher education. Uh, the IITs have been involved in this area for quite some time and uh, I think it's quite appropriate that uh, we are hosting this conference here. Uh, the whole thrust for a country like India is to have quality at a scale and uh, technology really has the promise to deliver on that and the IITs have been trying many experiments over the years. The first one was NPTEL, which is now a huge repository of lectures. Uh, I keep going to the NPTEL channel on YouTube. And uh, you know, uh, and I see that you know, it's not just being used by students from India, but it's being used by students from all over the world. And really, so this is an important repository, a world repository, and the hope is, of course, that there is some way that this content can constantly be updated and it can become more accessible and more useful over time. When I last looked, there were 70 million users of this content. So I know that this is being used, and so certainly it's worthwhile to see how we can make this content, uh, you know, in some sense, to stay alive. The second big experiment that happened, and that happened in uh, this institute, was to essentially have courses which targeted first a thousand participants at a time and then 10,000 participants at a time. And this was through the reach that was provided by the National Knowledge Network. This has also turned out to be quite successful. And uh, now this type of model is being replicated in many other places as well. And really, I mean, I can't imagine uh, bringing 10,000 participants into IIT Bombay for a course for two weeks. I mean, the logistics would have been unimaginable. But uh, to conduct this in 400 different centers over the internet with possibility of both two-way interaction over the internet, uh, this is a very powerful method. And uh, it seems to be quite successful. And even the participants seem to like this. The third phase that we are going into and that we've just started on are these massively online open courses, MOOCs. Uh, IIT Bombay has signed up with edX, and uh, this also has great promise. And uh, certainly, there are many uh, details to be worked out. But uh, we are experimenting with it. And we hope that, again, this will turn out to be a success. Uh, with the National Knowledge Network and the access that it provides to so many students uh, at relatively low cost, I think a program like MOOCs 
can certainly be successful provided we can come up with ways of certification and so forth and of course you know in all of this the underlying uh, theme that we'll be replacing teachers uh, is not really correct so you know this can at most augment so the presence of a teacher uh, is really important and so really this whole thing has to be woven together to keeping that in mind uh, we really have many people in this audience who are experts and i'm sure you're waiting to hear from them uh, so without further ado let me welcome you once again uh, and i wish you all the best for a very fruitful discussion here and i hope that many new ideas emerge thank you very much sir kakad uh many of you were here some time ago when i already introduced some portion of the theme of the conference so i'll not take much time suffice it to say that the schedule flows as follows initially there are some talks uh no problem including some keynote addresses this would be followed by showcase of the national mission projects across the country and after lunch the showcase of the projects which are being done at iit bombay this will be followed by perhaps the most important component as my friend pavan agarwal comes in simply let me welcome pavan and mr pravin prakash <laughs> pavan has been a thinker for many years i'll introduce him well later mr pravin prakash leads the national mission is the mission director so in the afternoon session there are going to be working groups where all the dignitaries are going to be divided into four groups and we would particularly like to listen from the state technical university vice chancellors and deans about the issues that have been flagged uh, uh, that paper is there in in your bag i would request you to kindly read it during the lunch time so you see in iit bombay you also have to work during lunch uh and after the group discussion we will have the uh, conference dinner in the hotel residence uh, all details are given there uh, tomorrow schedule i will briefly comment on later on when we meet so in order to save time let us uh, move over quickly to the next and the most important session and that is the inaugural address by professor mantha professor mantha is the chairman of iict he is of course an accomplished professor i have had privilege of personally working with him shoulder to shoulder on many of the government it schemes when he took over suffice it to say that apart from being an accomplished researcher he has been an accomplished administrator he has worked as he has served as pro vice chancellor for sndt before going to aict many of you are aware that aict was had become a very cumbersome organization and sort of not considered very good so when professor mantha went there uh, from his actions for the first 6 months i started calling him a jhadu wala who was doing a cleansing job this was much before the aam aadmi came with jhadu <laughs> but he does not stop there he has brought uncanny transparency by using e governance into ai city processes ai city is an important regulatory body which he is trying to make into a facilitating body without further ado I would like to request uh, Professor Mantha to give his inaugural address. Professor Mantha. Thank you, uh, Professor Fatak, <laughs> Professor uh, Devang Kakkar, uh, Sri Pawan Agarwal, and Sri uh, Praveen Prakash. First, uh, I believe we need a uh, lot of passion to drive. technology in education and we have some of the best people here i keep working with pawan and uh, pravin prakash they are not only pa passionate they also have the wherewithal to drive the systems so i believe uh, we are we are on the right uh, track with with several other professors from iits and so on uh, contributing to the to this uh, cause first of all uh, all the invited guests Uh, ladies and gentlemen very good morning to you all uh, i uh, believe uh, technology needs to be 
enabling, like Professor Fart said, and facilitating wherever and whenever this is used. There's no one size that fits all. And technology that uh, uh, works in one place may not work in another. One country may not work in another. Because the boundary conditions will seldom be the same. So the implementation strategies have to be different. The technologies per se may be available, may be usable, but they have to be uh, customized to the local requirements. And that's where the success factor lies. Any implementation should look at two propositions. One is uh, any, any implementation, for that matter, technology in education, that's the topic for today. Any implementation should essentially look at two uh, propositions. One is palliative, which, which means we need to look at the short term requirements. Every there is a preparatory stage, and there are certain immediate requirements which need to be addressed. And the second is the prophylactic. You look at future, try and build systems which uh, uh, satisfy your vision, your uh, requirements into a longer uh, time lines. So that said, today colleges <coughs> and students are connected to technology in education in ways that we could never imagine in our times. How do we take that advantage? Uh, how do we take advantage of that interest? And what are the best educational programs and innovative technological programs available to our institutions? And some of the discussion should essentially go around this. And what are the uh, means available to make this happen? And this, I believe these are some of the questions that need to be answered. Uh, reforms need to be uh, worked out in, a, in an environment in which you work first. That's within the self. And then you can push them into the environment. So therefore, in a generic sense, two domains are involved. One is the self, or the institution from which I come from and the environment of technical education space that deals with various uh, stakeholders. We have a large educational system. My institution, all of you know, is a regulator. And through an act of uh, parliament in uh, 1987, and looks at the larger uh, development and coordinated development of technical education throughout the country and so on. There are several objectives and so on within the and one of them is to facilitate uh, technology into the higher technical education space. Now, as far as the uh, regulatory functions are concerned, we look at almost 12,000 institutions at the undergraduate and postgraduate level in the country today, which essentially talk about 14,000 programs at uh, around 18,000 levels. Levels means PhD, masters, undergraduate program, and so on. Today, we have probably one of the largest enrollment in the world, anywhere in the world. In 13-14, we had an enrollment of 1.26 million students just in engineering. And even if you assume that 1 million students pass out every year, you have a very large system to worry about. E-governance procedures at at my institution are stakeholder driven in all the processes to bring in transparency and accountability. Fundamentally, we had a manual system earlier. So we moved out from that. A purely transactional based system, which was transactions are prone to corruption, as we all know. Transaction based system was converted to a process driven system. So an entire uh, Re-engineering was uh, required at that time, which was done. And today, we have a process-driven system open to scrutiny and also RTI compliant. Now, RTI compliant means a lot, which uh, needs several uh, functional changes within the, within the development stage. Like I, uh, then, uh, we create, therefore, we created a web-based uh, system, secured online access. To the institutions, everybody gets a virtual portal. 
and uh, it provides uh, reporting physical tools for ICT that which handles complex and dynamic requirements. We implemented Oracle Civil CRM and the OBI tools has uh, obviously helped in streamlining the system. In furthering the cause of this transparency, uh, we are also uh, we have also implemented the, all the all the workflows. In, in fact, uh, people sit at home, they make an application, they look at deficiencies sitting at home, printing the approval letters sitting at home. So that's the extent of uh, uh, automation that uh, was done uh, there. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the accounts, the, the all the internal processes, we have ten regional offices, video conferencing. Uh, on the fly, then tracking applications, all that is a part of the development that we have done. Further, electronic modes of payment, the entire payment process is through an e-payment gateway. And today, more than 250 crore re rupee receipts are made, and about 350 crore payments are made. So almost 600 crore transaction happens every year on this. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, we we are looking at a system which, in uh, in the later times, or in the last year or so, we have also implemented various uh, facilitating uh, mechanisms for st students. I I am bringing out all this because I would want to convey, kind of connect that to technology use of technology in education and where the institutions work. The entire information is in the public uh, domain today, uh, be it land documents or whatever documents that you talk about concerning an institution is there in the public uh, domain. We have one million student database today and six lakh faculty database and every one of them has a unique ID. And all the services, be it uh, uploading the projects at the postgraduate level, or placement services, or an education networking site that we have developed. All these services go through these unique IDs. Now, this this is my organization today, and in this process, the uh, re-engineering that I talked about also uh, it it just does, doesn't stop at the organization, but it also goes to the stakeholders. So there are several initiatives that have been undertaken. And uh, these uh, uh, have been mapped for the stakeholders. Now having said that, the second part, that how do we bring in this technology into education is something that I would want to touch now. And there are probably 10 reasons which set the tone for this conference. We all know, most of the things that I'm saying, we all know, but to understand the perspective, I'm just uh, informing, and based on that, what we have done in terms of interventions for higher education. One, we all know technology-enabled learning is something that has come here to stay, and what we need to do is use it optimally so that the best happens. Now, first and for there are ten reasons for this. I would want to highlight them: expansion of time and place. In a typical college, a student access is only sixty minutes in a class and uh, in a in a day which is about works out to about 10 percent with the teacher interaction and uh, uh, otherwise he would have about 100 percent internet uh, time so that's 10 times better uh, and this time is also shared between 60 students in the class so the time attention that he gets on a personal basis is slow and therefore expansion in time and place is something that's very, very useful. Depth of understanding is the second point. Interactive simulations, illustrations, they, they can all be made. And uh, people can, uh, instead of just using a ch chalk and uh, talk to the students, there can be a lot of uh, uh, value addition that happens through using the tools which are available for uh, technology-enhanced learning. The third point is learning versus teaching. You, instead of driving things into a, a student uh, for him to understand, you can make him participate in projects, in live demonstrations. And instead of pushing the activity, you can actually do it through a pull effect. The fourth is reason and collaboration. 
a vital skill in the new uh, world is the ability to work collaboratively in a technology enabled learning it's not just teacher and student but all together can participate and therefore <coughs> in fact earlier uh, there were uh, in the early uh, days the students used to used to discuss with each other and uh, come out with new ideas new uh, new ways of doing things and we at that time called it cheating today we we have to bring it into the mainstream because there are several advantages of doing that like technology changes we have uh, at one time uh, duplicating uh, different uh, uh, elements machine elements or whatever in whatever perspective you're talking about uh, was was also considered very uh, i mean it was not looked upon in the right uh, way uh, today you have rapid prototyping machines which which actually promote the duplication and and uh, the development that can happen on on that the so therefore there are certain good features which of technology enabled learning which we need to look at the uh, going global you can you can uh, boundaries uh, don't matter of places you can reach anybody anywhere any time individual pricing and sequence for, for example all information technologies can permit uh, you know the uh, price to come down and therefore <coughs> one can uh, legitimately use uh, technology at a lower price and so on whereas uh, books way the you can uh, host everything on a on a laptop and work out so therefore there are there are benefits like that personal productivity individual productivity would uh, stand to rise and the entire process would uh, uh, actually lower the cost now however uh, in in summary if education is about uh, knowledge and intellectual skills then information technology lies at the heart of it all now we at aict have only just begun this transition i'll give you a few points of what the transition is and school uh, our uh, colleges will eventually look very different which i am sure would happen in uh, in very uh, near future uh, we have we have all referred to uh, nptel uh, in the process in the aict uh, regulatory process nptel is mandatory so every institution today has a data center it, it uses an internet uses nptel and so on what probably needs to be done is uh, look at the content that is created we need more interactive content uh, because uh, i i believe the institutions that we have fall in three categories quality cannot extend end to end there is quality at the top there are very good institutions at the top there are there is a mid level of institutions which have the potential to move forward and there are institutions which need a lot of intervention so providing the same content across the spectrum would probably create its own challenges and we also have an affiliation system where all the institutions are affiliated with some university or the other and the the way teaching learning happens in each of those universities is is not exactly the same and therefore these these differences have to be taken into consideration while content is created and probably it's a good idea to make two levels of content one which bridges this this low end institutions into uh to move up and the better performing institutions to do little better how what kind of interventions are required to do that maybe the experts there are two projects which are running one with professor fatak and one with uh, professor junjunwala i believe uh, the efforts uh, through mhrd would would certainly make some difference at that point uh university curriculum is something that that's uh, fairly uh, we 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 give a model curriculum through the regulatory process but uh, the universities are autonomous and and there are always those changes bound to happen and therefore what we desire is that the in some essence the university content to be mapped to make a much more meaningful uh, entry into using technology in education and we have a large number of polytechnics almost 4000 of them which act as a mid level which which is actually the bridging value between the low end and the high end 
and there seems to be nothing available for the polytechnic education. We, through this process or some process, we need to uh, make that available. Uh, we have al already given a regulation for blended learning. So this is a, this is a process uh, which is real today. What we have done is uh, the teaching will happen uh, through enabled uh, learning methodologies, but the practicals we have said at this point of time should be face to face. And the simulation methodologies, they can all be explored depending on what kind of technology is available, what kind of uh, uh, link up, up linking facilities are available. Based on that, uh, how, how uh, uh, reliable this whole business is in order to reach out to people is something that we have to explore. We can use methods we already people have referred to MOOCs, edX, uh, the, uh, uh, the cloud initiatives, in what form they have to happen and what uh, way they can actually uh, do that value addition for to the, to the uh, education that is happening in the classroom is something that we really have to work out. Then uh, we uh, uh, most of our institutions, like I said, because of the initiatives that ACT pushed from its side, many of the institutions are now uh, actively into using technology. But what I feel is, in before before education, teaching, learning becomes a uh, becomes a focal point. Most of the institutions should be connected, to, uh, and uh, within the institutions, we believe some uh, ERP should function, and we feel that some uh, uh, a single a generic ERP model should be available which can be used by the institutions and some development efforts can be done towards that. And the best practice that practices that happen within the institutions will need to flow to other institutions and therefore I believe university network is something that we should really be working out. and all the universities coming together. All these institutions that I'm talking about incidentally are affiliated to at least 250 universities. Now, and each university has its own ways of working and so on, and bringing them together on single platform, sharing best practice itself a challenge and we need that to be uh, done. Uh, yeah. Then uh, we have also brought in uh, two things which I would want to mention about the quality aspect in technical education. There, we all talk about accreditation. Just two points on this. We have started off the process of uh, uh, quality uh, measurement, essentially driven through an input uh, measurement. Uh, the inputs were measured and, and the processes were designed in that fashion. Today we are talking about outcomes, measurement of outcomes and so on. But as a system, we understand that a system has several processes which go to build the system. So if, if education and quality of education is a concern for all of us, then every element within that, within that system also is of equal concern to us. For example, students is an important part of that system. Faculty is a part. Infrastructure is a part. There are several subsystems within the total quality that we would want to define for higher education. Now having said that, the uh, control at the output end, just measuring the outcomes in a, in a, in a to total sense would probably not do the job. What I would probably would like to see is each of these subsystem measured and working as a closed loop. So there are certain outcomes of the student, there are certain inputs given, there is a certain process built around the students, and that needs to be monitored. Similarly, faculty needs to be monitored. Similarly, infrastructure needs to be monitored. And each of those processes, if monitored and, and the uh, time to uh, stabilize is reduced, probably the system objectives would be delivered. And this would actually lead you into an adaptive kind of uh, accreditation model and we should probably make an effort in order to how how the technology could be built into that is is a matter of discussion but we probably need to do that as the last thing that i would want to measure my mention is uh, we have uh, brought in several mous which are which build that quality uh, 
factor into be it the students, the faculty, or whoever. For example, we have signed an MOU with uh, Microsoft, which is available about three years back to all of our students. In fact, 7.5 million students get 25 uh, GB space, a mail ID, uh, application software free of cost. So one part of that is taken care of, and uh, they progress further. Similarly, we have uh, MOUs with uh, Autodesk, where they give you 32 suit uh, free of charge. Now, all these happen through the student IDs that we have set, the services that are driven, and so on. We have an MOU with BSNL, which uh, allows the 43 training centers of BSNL to be used for fifth, sixth, seventh semester students to be trained in those activities. And uh, similarly, we have uh, a, an MOU with the American Association for Community Colleges to, in order to build the vocational education skills, training, and, and so on. And similarly, we have a MOU with O'Kerry, the British Com uh, High Commission in uh, Delhi, and so on. And uh, finally, what I would want to say is uh, there are several initiatives happening in this country. MHRD has been playing a very active uh, role. Now, what, hap what needs to be done is there needs a system integrator somewhere who looks at all the pieces of development that are happening, build them together, and bring it as a, as a single unit to the table so that every stakeholder in this process benefits. And technology in higher education is here to stay, and uh, probably uh, we need to change ourselves or before the before the environment starts changing us thank you thank you very much professor manta i think we'll all do well to remember the 10 important points that he mentioned and i would expect those to be deliberated upon further as i said i'll introduce professor raghavan in 30 seconds very difficult task like me he has been a professor at iit madras for a long time but he is today known as the architect of the National Knowledge Network. He is trying to move across information and knowledge to every nook and corner of the country. There are many other accolades, but I would request you to read his long bio, which will put up on the website later. Without further ado, let us listen to the architect of the National uh, Knowledge Network. Mr. Raghavan, all yours. Thank you, Professor Fatak. It's a pleasure to talk to elite audience in the academia that to using technology about a subject which is basically technology enabled learning. In fact, for MHRD, I believe the journey started about 10 years ago when Professor Anant and company tried to do video recording of lessons with IIT Madras as a nodal agency and many other institutions participating in that exercise. Now, over years, things have changed quite a bit, and we have come from offline recording to online delivery of lessons. Like Professor Manta mentioned towards the end of his lecture, that let us change ourselves before technology and the associated eco-environment to force us a change on us. I think that was a very powerful statement from Professor Manta. Taking cognizance of that, I think we have to look at all the efforts that the MHRD or the Government of India is putting in as of today. In fact, there is a presentation that I made to some group a year ago where I found that NMEICT, NKN, DTH, and NYFN together constitute something like 34, 35,000 crores of investment which can directly impact education and health care in this country. The infrastructure that is being developed is nothing less than the national asset for the whole country for generations to come. In fact, the kind of infrastructure that the NMEICT, MHRD, NKN have put together is going to have a very, very long impact on the country in time to come. I am extremely happy that MHRD has found my association and services quite useful during these years 
from 2003 upwards it has been my passionate association with whatever mhrd is trying to do in fact in a brief sweep of the camera i saw pavan who is sitting there who initiated me into this whole interaction sitting in the guest house in iit madras so my wife told me that there is one gentleman from mhrd who is wanting to see you urgently and i went there pavan was there he explained to me we want to do some large scale networking what is the solution your name is being talked about as the guy who can provide a solution in fact that was the starting point for me that i can be useful to the country and since then it was called vishwarupam at that point in time vishwarupam is essentially the large image that god assumes spanning the entire universe that was the name that was given to the project at that time when i submitted to mhrd which later became integrated national knowledge network and then national knowledge network and then nmeict started an exercise alongside and brought the entire academic community university sector along and now it's a single large framework now what's the advantage of this is that uh, our approach to education changes i keep mentioning that education is a process i don't have to repeat it to this august audience but nevertheless i will say it as my personal belief in a in a talk education is a process teaching is an individual action it can be done as best as one can but learning is an individual's experience in 30 years 35 years of teaching what i have learned is my teaching very well does not mean student will learn that requires a different passionate approach to the end user that the student directly dispassionately so that he can run the race himself it's not generating a usain bolt who can do the 100 meter dash in so many seconds but it is helping that individual in an inclusive framework that he is able to cross the 100 meters without any difficulty i mean that is the essence of education it is actually the manifestation of perfection already in man in fact it's not my words it's a way kind of those words so given that we have a framework today in the form of nkn where we can reach everywhere in the form of all the connected universities in the form of dth where multiple channels will be available irrespective of the location you are in it will come through the education channels that are going to come you know all these are going to happen in one go where does technology play a role it is may facilitating everything very easily number one the property this technology brings in is annihilation of distance that means there is no difference between where you are and where the teacher is you know you can feel that one to one interaction the second one is instantaneous observation of events so whatever happens at a distant site you are able to see and if you want to bring in some experimental results from cern geneva and then show it to your class in iit bombay it is possible with all these kinds of technologies that are put in place and people can have experience which are highly enriched because of this technology environment that makes a whole lot of difference in the learning process and that is where this technology plays a major role second thing that happens is the whole process of education undergoes a major change you don't have to repeat the same exercise everywhere and you we can do something about the languages and the dialects we can actually reach everybody in their own language and in their own dialect simultaneously and that too in real time in fact having created such a powerful infrastructure which is going to stay for perhaps tens of years or 10 15 years it will stay there and then it, the whole technology will undergo a massive transformation beyond that during this 10 15 years we should be able to see that as india which is a diverse country in terms of culture and uh, languages we can bring together all technologies associated with these languages and dialects and then if i speak in english i should be heard in all languages and all dialects simultaneously what does that mean a whole load of technologies have to be generated lot of research has to be done many super computers will be kept busy all over the place and all these are simultaneous and today what happens is we generate we deliver online we deliver in real time 
we make it available through the web media, we make it available through the DTH channels. At the same time, we capture the whole thing and preserve it in a server, which can be archived at a later point in time. And if somebody misses a lecture and he wants to go through it 10 times, that is available now. That's the technology enabled learning. The slow paced learners is also at the same level as the fast learners. The second thing that happens, a teacher, if he wants to say the same concept differently, he can edit it and put it there so that archival becomes easy. So the DTH transmission, the IP transmission, archival purposes, editing, creating e-contents, all these are getting done in one go, which is, I think, a phenomenal saving of labor. The other side of it is that we have to be extremely prepared about what we are saying. We, are, we have to be extremely prepared about the lectures. We have to be extremely prepared about the 40, 45 lectures that we give about a subject during a semester. And we also have to make sure that multiplicity is available so that the university system, the IIT system, and other collegial system does have the content that they require in our lectures. That's also a very, very detailed academic planning exercise by the individuals. If you feel that it is a huge opportunity, then it is a pleasure to do that. <laughs> of course, if it is seen as a liability, as larger, more work per one hour lecture, then it is a serious issue. I think there are enough people in this country who feel this is a pleasure, this is a huge opportunity that technology provides that you are leaving your lectures for posterity. In fact, from tomorrow when we lecture, we must remember that not just the 40 people in front of you are watching, the country is watching. The whole country is appreciating what you are saying. The whole country is behind you. The whole country is listening to you. The whole country is learning from you. You know, that's the change that is coming in to every teacher of tomorrow. And these infrastructures are providing that kind of facility. That is where Professor Manta's statement becomes extremely important that we change, our technology will change us. In fact, it is a, I see that as a very powerful statement. We change, our technology will change us because we will have no option there and all. Other thing that is going to be a serious problem is about the perception management related to examination and certification. Because examination, correction of papers, conducting exams, giving results, giving marks is not going to be easy when you do such a massive levels of education. In fact, when class sizes go beyond 100, 200 and so on, people find it very difficult to evaluate the students themselves in a given semester in a place like IIT. You need a lot of teaching assistance and the uniform quality has to be ensured. So that evaluation quality, evaluation process, examination systems, automation required therein, researchers required there are going to be important steps where MHRD will be investing, I suppose, in future. Because these are addendums that are required for consolidating the gains that are coming out of the technology enhanced learning. If you look back in 2003 or so, we started by doing cold storage, you know, record lessons, keep it for somebody, and then give a CD out. And where we are now, online lectures on the go. And where we are going to go is that when you present, it is also going to be preserved, edited, archived for future. So we are actually transiting in our own lifetime over a period of 10, 12 years, the entire spectrum. And the powerful technology like you know, what is used in NKN or NME ICT is that annihilation of distance which is coming out and the low latency which gives you a high level of interaction with students irrespective of the number is going to be a big boon to be able to talk to anybody. So this is where the technology is and this is where the technology is going and this is where the academic administrative decisions have to be directed in time to come. And I think with all you people, I'm told all vice chancellors are attending from state universities and many academics are attending. I think with your cooperation, MHRD will be able to move fast forward. And I see Praveen Prakash there, who is a very dynamic uh, JS in MHRD, who is always enthusiastic about doing something extremely new and extremely fast. In fact, yesterday alone, he must have called me three, four times to make sure that he says the right things to the audience today. 
I said, don't worry, I will also cover some of it and come to your lecture. I suppose, Praveen, I have done my job and I wish you all the best in your endeavors. I think between Pawan and Praveen, you have the left bracket and the right bracket for technology enabled learning. That's what I see. And of course, in between the academic space is the Devang Kakar is sitting there. <laughs> so I think the left bracket, the material and the right bracket are there. And the supporting system side, I think Professor Manta is sitting there, who is a regulatory supporting system that is required for the entire process. Thank you for this intervention and the enabler, Dr. Fatek, who is always a brilliant, very enthusiastic, unbeatable a personality. I've known him for maybe 30, 40 years now. We have been together in many occasions. Thank you, Professor Fatek. Thank you, IIT Bombay. Thank you, Dr. Kakar, Praveen, and Pawan. Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Raghavan, for that excellent talk and for complimenting whatever Professor Mantha said. Uh, as I said, I will take two minutes. I like the left bracket and right bracket. You know what brackets do. They chew up anything that stands in between. <laughs> so my director, uh, I, I, and my director represents all that is happening, not only in IIT Bombay for the National Mission Projects, but in all the academia everywhere else. Uh, we are fortunate that under his leadership, we have taken big strides. As he said, massive online open courses will be offered. I am tempted to mention something up front before taking it up later. Our own MOOCs courses will start getting offered from 29th of July. But what we have decided to do additionally is to offer a blended MOOCs as directly benefiting uh, a course to the students whose grades for their universities will come from this blended MOOCs. Talking about the required efforts. I can tell you that some of us who have tried these things, ordinarily if we require, let's say, two to three hours of work for one lecture, then while preparing our lectures for teacher's training program, the massive teacher's training program that he said, and many of us who have participated, Professor Vikram Gadre is here, it takes anywhere between five to six hours to prepare for one hour. But those of us who have tried a uh, flipped classroom like Professor Kannan and my colleague Kameshwari and those of us who are preparing for MOOCs, let me tell you it takes 25 to 30 hours of work to prepare one hour of content. 25 to 30 hours of work. Now that is the kind of effort that is required. We are trying to facilitate that effort by using teams and technologies. And that is where what uh, Professor Raghavan said and what Professor Mantha said is to mainstream the usage of such effort, mainstream the usage of NPTEL contents, for example, by appropriately modifying it to suit the requirements of the user, these are going to be the major challenges. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Raghavan, for participating from a distance. And uh, I, I, I will end by saying one thing. I first suggested to him, why doesn't he come on Skype? He said, Skype does not give us good quality. And I said, but my friend Anand Agarwal from Australia is speaking on Skype. He says, Australians might be willing to compromise on quality, but India shall not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks to my team, led by Sajjan and his team there. Yes. Thank you. you know, Anand cannot beat this quality. No, <laughs> no, nobody can. But let me tell you, wherever the 300 remote centers where we deliver our teacher's training program, wherever those colleges have latched onto NKN with good bandwidth, the interaction is exactly of this quality. And that is what we should obtain in all 5,000 engineering colleges. In the That's what it is. So thank you very much, Professor Raghavan. Please join us for tea. <laughs> you, have, you sip your tea there. We'll have the tea here remembering you. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome back. So friends, I hope all of you have settled down. We have now another set of exciting presentations. And this part of the session is led by none other than Dr. Anup Gupta. As I said, I, I will take about 15 minutes to read his entire biography. Suffice it to say that uh, uh, he is the president of India gold medalist from IIT Delhi, uh, which was our director, Professor Devang Kakkar's earlier institution. Uh, he was a teacher like us. He taught at Stanford for many years before uh, 
stepping out and joining the corporate world, but he stuck to research. He has some extraordinary accomplishments to his credit. The one which I like most is not what he has done subsequently in Microsoft, but what he did earlier in terms of compression of audio video uh, uh, piece of information, which is so vital today. Incidentally, another PGM from your own college, uh, Professor Vikram Gadre, who is a teacher with us, is continuing to work on scalable uh, encoding of uh, video material and so on. So without further ado, uh, I would request uh, uh, Dr. Anup Gupta to deliver his keynote address. Anup, all yours. Thank you, Dr. Pada. So can everybody hear me? Is the, uh, so it's wonderful uh, to be here, to be amongst so many distinguished colleagues and old friends, uh, Professor B. and Jane, who is there. He used to be my thesis advisor at uh, IIT Delhi and Dr. Parak I've known for such a long time. And for all of us, you know, what we have achieved, what we have done, education has been such a fundamental component of where we are. So it is, you know, it is the thing that empowers. So, and we have to see how do we enable that for everybody, you know, around the world, in the country. So it's something, a really core, core mission uh, that is there. So I want to talk about you know, trends and actually go fairly deep. And what I thought I would start with is I will tell you my punchline to begin with. There are four key messages that I want you to go away with. Okay? So there are, as we look at what we are talking about today, the fundamental issues of access for everyone, how do we assure scale? you know, that in this country is so important. How do we ensure quality and in a cost-effective way? So I won't emphasize a lot. I just have one slide later. I'll go into it. But everybody knows, you know, this is the key promise that we need to deliver on. The second is that how we teach and learn today has remained the same now for hundreds of years. In the digital world, the same pedagogies don't apply apply different ways we need to rethink all of that. We have to look at the learning science and say what needs to be done differently. We all know at some level the way we teach at most institutions around the world, including Stanford's, Harvard's, and IIT, the lecture model is not a good model to communicate really. So we've got to see how we do things differently in the digital world. The third point is around MOOCs, and there's certainly a lot of uh, talk about MOOCs. Uh, Anant Agarwal is actually a close friend of uh, mine who's going to talk later. He and I were together at Stanford for a little bit of time. And I think he would agree MOOCs are a great start, but we should also understand there is a lot of evolution that still needs to happen before the dust settles and what's going to be there. And finally, I think one key to success, not the only key to success, is going to be powerful tools and platforms that really enable both the faculty, the administrations, the students to participate in this digital revolution. So this one, I, I won't spend a lot of time. This is about the scale, quality, access. Uh, you know, uh, my friends uh, in MSR India, Vidya, Nandan, tell me, you know, 5,000 colleges, 50,000 faculty. I was looking at one of the notes that got sent around, sort of a lack of, we need 4 lakh faculty more in the country, how are you going to train them with four uh, million engineering students? One of the things actually, uh, uh, Dr. C.K. Prahlad, when he was there and he was working with the uh, government, I wrote a white paper for the prime minister at that time, which was around how are you going to train 400 million in vocational training? So it is not just about the engineering students. If you look at the larger population and what we do, Technology and what we do and how we achieve scale is just fundamental. That's the only way we have in terms of you know, what we can do. So across engineering, across all the subjects, looking at scale, looking at quality, uh, you know, as we get to tier two, tier three, broader institutions is fundamental. So I wanted to next jump back, as I said. So that part everybody knows. I don't need to emphasize. I wanted to talk a little bit about the pedagogy in the digital age, what is happening, what are some of the things we are learning, and what can be different. 
So the first thing is that actually the traditional lecture model is not a great way to teach. So this is uh, uh, actually, a, uh, so you know, this was done, you know, Professors Kurt Mazur at Harvard and Carl Wyman, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, at Stanford currently. They've looked a lot at science education. And the red bars show how many concepts students remember at the end of the lecture, one week later, two weeks later, and the fact is less than 30% of the concepts they didn't already know are learned in terms of what's taught in the classroom. And using different techniques, you know, from how you do clickers in the classroom with everybody to how do you even in a lecture room like this, how do you get small group discussions going with people that are sitting next to each other, you know, it shows you can almost double the amount of learning that happens in the classroom. Okay, so regardless of what we look at, so you know, the lecture model as is, is not the greatest model. It's sort of uh, interesting that people learn despite uh, <laughs> the lecture model that we have. And so how we try and improve is, you know, a pretty fundamental part we need to think about. And I think there are things that we can do. The second thing is around what the learning science tells us and what we can do. Okay, so on the left-hand side, I talk about a group that, you know, the guy who heads all of uh, technology and education for Kaplan Learning Systems in the U.S. and uh, Rick Hess is another famous person. Done. So there are a few different things. So firstly, thinking about short-term memory and long-term memory in humans and the whole notion that as we practice things, things become pretty obvious, intuitive, that when you have to do multiplication and you have to drive a car, you don't have to think about it. And how do you get more stuff into that long-term, just pattern matching memory of, of the students becomes the foundation as they learn higher concepts and how are we gonna enable that and thinking deeply about that. The second is the value of multi-sensory, multimodal, what we see with our eyes, what we write down, what we hear, all of these things when they come together, what's your emotional state become important factors to how we learn and what happens. And thirdly, fundamentally, the notion of deliberate practice, where you're continuously trying and trying again to get it into your long-term memory, and the notion of immediate feedback. What doesn't work is, you know, I listen to a lecture or something gets confusing. I do my, you know, I get an assignment. I do it at the end of the week. The graded one comes back two weeks later. By the time it comes back, you've lost context. You're not interested. The fact that immediate. So if you look at MOOCs, right, today where they insert quizzes every three minutes and say, are you learning? As you do the mastery learning process, it becomes fundamentally important. And there's a whole lot of things, you know, that technology can do from access, affordability, efficiency, data richness uh, that are there. The fundamental thing we have to think about is that technology doesn't change how humans learn. How we learn has been developed in terms of evolutionary processes. What technology does is facilitate, and in particular, in terms of uh, you know, digital technologies, one of the core things is that there are a lot of things where we have no feedback loops. You know, so what this audience that we have here is thinking, learning, what are the confusing things are simply not known to the instructor or to the students themselves or, and digital technology. So from the single 6.02 MOOC that the edX people did, this is the first course that Anand taught, you know, there were 230 million interaction points uh, that came out from which we can finally start learning whether it is how students learn or how the course design happens or how the learning science itself advances, all of these things uh, become really important. Just like how Amazon works, Facebook works, Google works, Microsoft works, these things are being driven by data. Finally, education can start coming into the same age. Uh, becomes uh, So the main thing, this is kind of a summary slide in some sense that we've talked about. You know, we live in this traditional world uh, that is there, and it's not about just taking technology to emulate this world. And many of you have sort of you know, talked about it. How do we get to personalized learning and mastery learning? The notion that you master one concept before you move on to the next concept, that makes a big difference in how much students learn. Everybody doesn't have to go at exactly the same 
pace, the notion of flipped classrooms where the broadcast mode can be done at home with lots of embedded quizzes and simulations and the classroom time becomes much more where you do your homeworks. Um, you know, how do you get interactive? How do you get continuous feedback into the loops become fundamentally important things that we need to go towards. So the opportunity, of course, is, you know, how do we get to quality education for everyone? And the beauty in some sense today is that many factors are coming together, both what is possible through technology, what we understand through learning science, uh, you know, can be delivered in pretty unique ways. So let me go on to the next topic and talk a little bit about MOOCs and what's happening there. So MOOCs are really exciting. You know, one of the biggest things that's happened, certainly I can uh, say about a lot of faculty and institutions in the uh, universities there is people didn't used to talk about learning at universities. You know, they used to talk about their research. They used to talk about advancement, how students learn, how the thing has to advance was not a discussion topic in the hallways of major universities. Suddenly, it's become a hot topic. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's asking questions. And that's a wonderful first step to getting to transformation and making things happen. So certainly, you know, online uh, education is becoming more accepted, as you can see over the years. So these are some slides I picked up from Mary Meeker, who is with Kleiner Perkins Varsity. She does her internet report every year. You know, so you can see that. Uh, almost 20% people think it is even superior to the lecture mode. A lot of people think it's the same. So the perceptions are changing, you know, which is a good thing. There is an increasing number of people who are participating in this process. So again, this is you know, US data, where almost 30% of students are taking at least one online course. You know, so that's goodness, too. There's greater acceptance out there. Now, my own view on where things are is, you know, there are generally three phases in terms of uh, adoption of digital technologies. The first is we just take whatever we did before, we put them online. So, you know, I would say the MIT Open Courseware project in 2001, 2002 was that. We took our lectures, we just put them online and said, wonderful, magic will happen. You know, it doesn't really happen so easily, but, uh, you know, that's just a natural first step. The second is where you do some value-added features on top of what you did used to do before. Uh, I think that's where MOOCs are today. You know, so we have taken them, we've added a lot of quizzes, we've added some peer-to-peer -peer grading, discussion forums, we've added them, made them more interactive, and that's where we are. But the fundamental things happen when there's a whole process redesign that happens because of the way digital technologies are there, how entertainment is distributed, how commerce is done, is now in a fundamentally different and change process that is there. And I think many of these things will be uh, important. There was a very interesting Wall Street Journal article uh, on October 18th, which talked about an early report card on MOOCs and discovered what edX is doing, Coursera is doing, Udacity is doing, many of these companies. So firstly, they said, you know, who the students are, most of them are already in four-year colleges or they are doing their master's degree or they're employed. Okay, it's not reaching a lot of students, you might say, who are not in college in some way. I think they still benefit to all of this. Okay, the second thing is, you know, uh, many of them are dropping off. And when it is free, it's not required. You know, I was very busy to finish 38%. Uh, the best I like is the 6%, which is I forgot about the course. <laughs> you know, it's very easy to do when you are you know, sitting in an online uh, world that is there, you know, and we get data like in terms of passing grades. Of course, there are early teething challenges. So when Udacity did the MOOC with San Jose University, the first time around in spring 2013, the passing rates were low, but by the time they did it the second time around with some other interventions, the passing rates were as good as were there, you know, in their regular classroom things, and we get also wonderful data uh, in terms of, you know, so this is the length of the video that was authored, and this is the length of the video that people watched. So if it is six to nine minutes, people watch 6.25 minutes, but as you start making longer, they don't watch longer, they actually start coming down, the total amount of time that people watch. So the basic fundamental thing on the internet is, you know, don't make one-hour lectures. People are not gonna watch them, okay? 
they simply <coughs> so the wonderful, you know, this thing of data, we can start doing it. And, you know, from our friends in MSR India who are doing the massively empowered classrooms thing, you know, some of the data I got from them is basically in India, the people who are using these MOOCs that are there are the self-motivated people who are already, you know, passionate and desirous. And as you're trying to cover the vast majority of people who need to be trained, educated, the current revolution is missing them out, okay? The syllabus is different when you take an MIT edX course than what you need to learn for the class. It doesn't help what questions are going to be there. I want to see what my professor is teaching because that's what the exams are going to be there. Uh, you know, the industry is not using them. So there are a lot of challenges um, uh, that we have. And so my main message of this kind of third element of my talk was around uh, it is a journey. Okay, and we are at the beginning stages of a journey. You know, we don't understand how do we motivate local faculty to engage and tell their students and act in terms of getting things done. What should be the modularity of content courses? Do they have to be 10 weeks, 14 weeks long, and you, you know, whatever number of 20, 30 lectures? So do we want to follow that model versus the Wikipedia model where you say it's a lot of small pieces that people can assemble? Or what the Khan Academy does. So if you look at the Khan Academy content, everything is five minutes long. And then, you know, basically as you follow the competency-based model and the pathways, people pick up concepts uh, that are very useful, uh, you know, to them where they're having a difficulty. So there are many different ways that we can do. Are the MOOCs just media-rich e-books? Okay, I mean, just like the textbooks have been very yes, uh, useful to education, but they haven't fundamentally changed education and what happens are MOOCs something just like that. So uh, lots of exciting questions. I have a few viewpoints on, you know. So my belief one is around uh, empowering local faculty. Okay, that you can't take the human out of the loop. You can't say, here are professors, just a few people at IITs or Harvards or MITs or Stanfords and everybody's gonna do that. The needs are different, the needs are distinct, the, what needs to be covered is different, and getting those people enrolled and uh, take ownership of what they do is really important. The second thing, again, these are just my beliefs, uh, people may differ, and that will be interesting discussion <laughs> as we uh, go through the rest of the days, is around modular content. I actually very much like the Wikipedia Khan Academy-like model in terms of broad enablement of learning where sections are there available for people to learn and they can then be sequenced you know, for a variety of ways. Larson and Tubro need something and so you know, they piece together things, what needs to be there. And clear rights just means you know, copyright and all those kinds of issues if it's clear and you know, it's all Creative Commons, it works. Then the third thing is around, can you have powerful tools that allow people to take these modular elements that are there you know, look at them as atoms and sort of weave them into molecules. You know, bigger chunks or still bigger chunks that can be assembled in a variety of ways to create the mashups so people start owning the local faculty, those content. We need to think about, you know, what I call about non-siloed analytics. So as you think about a lot of simulations, you know, like in the uh, 6.002 course at MIT, they had the circuit simulator and they had other tools. So if I, in my lecture or lesson, I include something from MIT, something some other app somebody's done, something another app that a third party has done. What usually happens in these cloud-based things is the analytics just goes to each of those three different things. The analytics don't come by. I, as a teacher or a faculty member, have to go to many, many different places versus designing the system so the analytics come back to me. And I think there are some really good ideas there, what we can do. And then the final two I had were around, you know, how do we put embedded social and collaboration things so that they keep people motivated and how can we do personalized learning and credentials that make a difference. All of these motivating factors are really important. Uh, sorry I'm sort of rushing through a little bit to stick but uh, so the final topic I wanted to cover is a little bit about powerful tools and platforms. You know as humans we have advanced as there have been more powerful tools that have enabled us to do. So we have got to simple, similarly think about in this world, you know, what we can do 
to uh, enable things. Microsoft is working on a lot of different things. The Massively Empowered Classrooms project that is going on in MSR India. Rakesh Agarwal is working on how to enhance books. I know some of you people know Sumit Gulwani, who was the present gold medalist from IIT Kanpur, who has been working on how do you automatically generate problems and grade problems. A guy named Sumit Bas who is working on if you start doing short answer and questions, how do you grade when there are 10,000 people much, much more effectively? So there's a variety of things that we are doing. Here I wanted to talk about one project in a little bit more detail. And this one addresses many of the things that were raised in the morning of how content is produced, how do you get interactive elements inside, how do you get analytics and feedback inside uh, of it. Uh, it's hard for me to demo it here. I was thinking of doing it, but just the way the internet connections and everything were, worked, I couldn't. I'll try a little bit of that. Now, there are a few different pieces in this. So firstly, it is not about MOOCs as a small number of people doing it. It is about democratizing online blended learning and trying to span both K through 12, so you know, uh, elementary, middle, high schools, and the college level. It is about creating online lessons, and I will show you an example in a second, and hopefully the internet is all still <coughs> uh, working, on what it looks like, the experience and the interactivity that you can generate, and how you can generate in five to 10 minutes versus the 20 hours, how you can take your existing stuff, build it online, and I'll be happy to show demos. How do you engage it with embedded interactive? How do you publish and share? How do you consume on any arbitrary platform? How do you get analytics to drive personalization? So let me take you to a demo, and I'm going to try and sit down a little bit to see if we can make it uh, work. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the consumption experience, right? So I've created something. What does the interactive experience look like for the user? Okay, so let's see. I will go. Uh, here. And I think this one. So this is something I created in a very short time. It looks like a lesson that you know you would have in edX or Coursera or any of the things. Basically, what you have is PowerPoint with audio, video, inking, narration. Uh, that's there. Provide a brief introduction to Project Athena. Okay. So the few high value standard let me go. So you know this was the slide I had around. <coughs> On the education side, there is a tremendous movement on what is called one-to-one -one computing, uh, where every child has a um, you know, computer and how it can enhance their learning. And the task that we face is how do we move from this traditional model of assembly line learning uh, you know, a lot of lecturing going on in the classroom. So, so there's all this kind of stuff, the capabilities, animations, so everything here, I mean, just seamlessly you know, works. Being able but to let's go to the interactive elements, okay? So I will start talking a little bit about them, and then I'll show you how this gets created. And through all of this, the instructor or the author gets feedback. So let me go to the first interactive element. So this is just a quiz that I had created, and so you know I can go, I can submit, get wrong, hints, and everything that I have been doing while experiencing the lecture is going into databases which will get turned into analytics for the professor and teacher to go and see. Okay, so everything, every interaction, just like in the edX, Coursera, everything is there. So I can do, I can say, you know, it was about how particles acquire mass, I can submit that, correct, I can continue on. So not only can we do um, these kinds of quizzes and arbitrarily sophisticated quizzes, uh, we can also get a lot of interactive labs there, uh, and labs created by others but embedded labs. in science. Okay, so I will and just quickly, uh, in terms of time, so here is a Khan Academy lab that is there, and so the work was done really by Khan, not by us. Uh, in this case, but it makes it very easy, as I'll show you a, l a little bit on the authoring side, you know, how these get created, and I can even, you know, do this, and I can say, you know, 18 is the thing, and so I can do 9 here plus 6, so this is 15 over 18, and I can, you know, put the answer there, so that is 5 over 6, 
and I can submit and check answer, get another, take a hint. So arbitrary amounts of interactions can be built right into uh, this thing. We can have more sophisticated problems. Again, I'm showing you, you know, what Khan Academy has done. Um, and the core concept is that you leverage, yes, so, so these are being imported and these can be imported from anybody because it is essentially an iframe that is embedded inside with backward linkages that are there. And so, you know, I can interact there. I can uh, have lots of other elements uh, that are there and uh, animations also embedded video. allows you to add other types of interactive elements. And what is playing here is really PowerPoint in the background, so it's not taking video bandwidth of that. Only the little video piece that I have or the audio piece and the inking is coming through in that, and I'll take you to more interesting things. So instead of just giving a pointer to a Khan Academy We're video, first exposed to the idea. here I have embedded a Khan Academy video in the sequence of first the lesson that I am So creating. this guy has a larger X and a larger Y. Let's start with him. So the change in Y. So you know, these things can be there. You can do screen recordings right inside. So this is a screen recording uh, uh, that is there. So it's just taking a little bit of time coming through. <coughs> This is just a very short video showing that. So this is a screen recording. You can have web pages embedded inside. So if you have web-based exercises and tools and games that you have generated and so you have a fully interactive web, you can embed video. So there's just all kinds of things that you can do uh, uh, in this world. And you can also go and get analytics. So if I look at this particular thing that I was just showing you, I can see on each slide how many people have watched it. This one, you know, 70, 88 people have watched it. 168 minute, 0.8 minutes spent per slide, you know, or one minute out of 1.6 minutes uh, spent. Or I can look by users as to who all have visited and how much time they spent, how many quizzes they did, what did they get right, what did they get wrong. So it is just automatically generated all of that uh, uh, from the back end that is there. And to share something like that, you just share the way you might on a YouTube or something like that. It's actually not timeline based, because timeline based is actually pretty complex for a lot of people, you know, especially younger teachers, et cetera, to deal with. This is laid out in the sense of a PowerPoint slide sequence. So if you reorder the slides, it reorders it, you insert another slide, add something, you can modify it. You think about your PowerPoint deck as the source code. And when you publish, you're essentially compiling and creating a lesson that what you were just watching. Again, so in the afternoon sessions, let me not take time. I'm going to just rush through <laughs> right now. I'll be happy to show you and actually create some things for you. And you can see how simply uh, it can be done. Uh, I wanted to show a little bit of the creation experience because you can't. I couldn't do it. So in the authoring experience, this is a standard you know, PowerPoint deck that is there. In this PowerPoint deck, you will see there's an Athena tab that I went to. In the Athena tab, I just pick a camera you know, that I can pick. I pick a pen and I can start writing into it. I can either ink or you can see that I am now recording out there. Okay, so I write whatever, and that's the kind of stuff that you were seeing earlier that uh, when I was doing. Once I come out, the video is associated with each slide. I can reposition the video, I can re-edit the video, I can you know, reduce the size, I can reorder slides, it will reorder those things. Uh, you know, that deck is on your device, you can go and change it and republish it. You can do all of those kinds of things. And so you know, here I was just thinking, I've reordered some things. I can go here, I'm going and adding a quiz inside uh, the slide. So this is just a way to add a quiz. I can similarly add videos, interactive labs. I hit a single button, uh, publish, and boom, you get this online video that you can use and create. This is, I'm inserting a Khan Academy video uh, right now. It's actually a lot more than that, but again, the, because it's not just enriching the thing. There is a publishing process. There is a analytics data. It's basically taking it to the web world rather than just being in the 
PowerPoint world and it's doing. So, you know, here I can share and things like that. So I'm going to actually go past where we are. So if you look at what it allows you to do in some senses, you know, so part of this personalized mastery learning, so the, the purpose of this bringing this slide back is it addresses several of the concerns, you know, or areas that we said. So if you're trying to do personalized uh, mastery learning, you're creating these objects, you know, just like Khan Academy that other people can watch. They can take different pathways through. They can interact. It lets you, it helps you support the flipped classroom. It allows by inserting simulations as easy as inserting clip art into your PowerPoint, something that people are familiar with, lets you take much more interactive courseware. Or if you author a simulation once, it can be used by every teacher, even in the local colleges. You don't have to. One of the ways they talk about it is, imagine we were in the world where we had typing pools. Right? So when I did my thesis, actually, <laughs> in 1980, we didn't word process it ourselves. We took it to a typing pool. And I took it, and I wanted to change it. And it was such a thing, and she had to reorder, and the page numbers went wrong. Everything went wrong. So when you work today in producing a video, and what takes 25, 30 hours is you have to work with these videographers who are in control, and every change is expensive. Next time you want to teach it, you want to add a new example, it's expensive. You know, it's troublesome. You don't take the effort to do it. This just totally makes it simple how you do it and embed uh, continuous feedback. So back to my uh, key messages. So this is the last slide, uh, and we're really done. So I think the issues really are well known. Everybody knows what we are trying to do with access, scale, quality. Um, I think we need to rethink the pedagogy. It is not about just capturing lectures, you know, me standing here and sharing that. There's value in that, but I don't think we should stop there. I think we need to go beyond. That, um, I think uh, for all of the reasons I said, we don't understand MOOCs too well. There is nothing that says they have to be 10 weeks long. There's nothing that says they have to be 45 minutes long. How do we rethink uh, you know, how education is? What's the role of the teacher? What happens in the classroom? And as I said, again, one set of key factors. You know, there are many other social and policy matters that are there. I think will be powerful tools and platform that allow us to use some of these digital age technologies. And thank you. I hope I didn't go too much over time. <laughs>